जुबिया टू गो नमस्ते एंड ग्रीटिंग्स आई सुबिया मोइन रिसर्चर एट इम्प्रे इम्पैक्ट एंड पॉलिसी रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट प्रभाव एवं नीति अनुसंधान संस्थान नई दिल्ली एक्सटेंड माई वॉर्मेस्ट वेलकम टू यू ऑल एट इम्प्री वेब पॉलिसी टॉक टूडे वी आर गैदर्ड फॉर अ स्पेशल टॉक ऑन द टॉपिक फेमिनिस्ट री इमेजिनेशन ऑफ सोशल थियोरीज बाय डॉक्टर लीना पुजारी दिस डिलिबरेशन इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द स्टेट ऑफ जेंडर इक्वालिटी हैश टैग जेंडर गैप सीरीज which is organized by the impri gender impact study center as the chair for the session we have professor vibhuti patel visiting distinguished professor at impri and gisc former professor tata institute of social sciences mumbai we welcome you ma'am with permission of chair i would like to introduce the gathering please introduce the lecturer and the special Uh, discussions thank you ma'am we are elated to welcome our distinguished speaker dr leena pujari dr leena pujari is a feminist sociologist and researcher who believes in teaching for social transformation and in nurturing critical and analytical minds currently she is associate professor and head department of sociology kc college she specializes in gender studies and has been passionately involved for two decades in creating a gender just and emancipatory space on campus among her several meaningful initiatives as convener of gender issues cell of her college include a certificate course in gender studies to help build a critical feminist perspective among students setting up a legal cell a first of its kind initiative for the undergraduate colleges in mumbai to provide free legal counseling to students and staff members on issues of domestic violence and sexual harassment her most recent publications include doing sociology of gender in the classroom reimagining pedagogy published by sage a chapter on transforming the sociology classroom implementing a critical feminist pedagogy in an edited volume geeta chada and mt joseph um, edition 2018 published by rulech sexual harassment is endemic in academic spaces an insider's perspective published in economic and political weekly gender dimensions of media insights from within economic and political weekly and disrupting the gender binary querying feminist pedagogy in an edited volume published by rulech as a member of the board of studies in sociology She has contributed extensively to curriculum design and development. She is an avid researcher and has researched on tribal women in Odisha, child rights in Mumbai and New Zealand, and most recently led a team of researchers on a UNFPA funded project on major media houses in Mumbai and the gender sensitive components. We welcome you, ma'am. Uh, we are also joined by esteemed discussant. Uh, first of all, we'd like to welcome Professor Polly Walkley. professor department of women studies guwahati university guwahati we would also like to welcome professor shweta prasad professor of sociology department of sociology faculty of social sciences banaras hindu university varanasi we would also like to welcome professor shruti shruti tambe head department of sociology center for advanced studies savitribai phule pune university pune we extend a very warm welcome to all of you now i invite our chair professor vibhuti patel to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks invite our esteemed speaker and to proceed further we look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering thank you thank you uh, first of all i would like to thank both uh, dr arjun kumar and zubia and the impre team for giving platform for such an exciting topic and also inviting special lecture and today's distinguished speaker dr lina pujari dr shruti tambe professor shweta prasad professor polly poklin uh, all of them are going to make it make the discussion very very lively and exciting we have got tremendous response more than 200 uh, students and scholars and teachers and academicians and policy makers have joined us i would like to first of all 
I feel very reminiscent when uh, talking about feminist reimagination of social theories. During my college days, when I got exposed to social theory, the, the establishment theories were reigning supreme. It was reading of Second Sex by Simon de Bois, who sparked post-war discussions on feminism, morality, existentialism, that I developed not only critical eye with regard to social theories, but also an insight into the feminist efforts at engendering social theories. And I would like to begin with the quote uh, from Simone de Boer, her sharp critique of the mainstream theories, social theories. And I quote, uh, in male existentialism, women are disposable. As much as existentialist works make a proper pit for introspection, I can't help but be privy to the gender space that it is. They might be props to aid a story, temporarily salvage the protagonist from his loneliness or be poles apart enough for him so that he can ultimately navigate his thoughts further. So I think this is a very, very powerful statement that she made and feminist reimagination re of social theories emerged from such efforts by the women's political movement for women's rights in economic, political, socio, cultural and education spheres. During the first wave of feminism and contribution of Mary Wollstonecraft or Susan B. Anthony was marked by women's suffrage movement of the late 19th and early 20th century we challenge the inequalities between men and women in the spheres of public life, in voting rights, in political participation, property and inheritance rights, employment and equal rights in marriage and in public life. It challenged the gender-based division of labor and critiqued the male-centered social theories in ethnography, anthropology, history of colonialism and orientalism. Second wave feminism and its theories, such as Simone de Beauvoir or Betty Friedan and Ria Dworkin of the late 60s and 70s, they demanded liberation of social theories from misogyny and initialization of women in public uh, 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 and also public and private dichotomy that defined social theories in sociology, economics, psychology, and history. Philosophical influence of existentialism, modernism, postmodernism, structuralism, poststructuralism theories were challenged by the feminists. They also brought in so-called personal problems of women, quote unquote, personal problems like violence against women, sexuality, reproductive health issues, women's role and labor in the home and unpaid care work and patriarchal cult culture, control over sexuality, fertility, and labor of women in the realm, in the realm of uh, academia, in, uh, economy, in uh, political spheres, and in cultural spheres. The third wave feminism that began in 80s not only critiqued the politics of second wave but it, uh, and its biases in favor of white, middle class, heterosexual uh, women uh, and its exclusion and suppression of viewpoints of women of color, the poor, gay, lesbian, transgender people, women from post-colonial world, but also provided sharp critique of existing meta theories for its essentialist and universal notion of womanhood and brought issues of racism, homophobia, Eurocentrism and uh, transcending of gender binaries in their theorization. In 1983, the path breaking contribution in feminist epistemology by Sandra Harding and Meryl Hintika, uh, titled Discovering Reality Feminist Perspective in, on Epistemology, Metaphysics, Methodology, and Philosophy of Science, had a global ripple effect. In fact, in Bombay, we started study circle with uh, Darius Kandiyoti's paper, which I had picked up from Nairobi conference in 85. And that's how the Vacha study circle is lasted for uh, nearly nine years. Every uh, fourth Saturday of the month we used to meet, we were discussing this. And the deconstructivist projects, and which demonstrated how masculinity is perspective and presumption, they shape social theories. And then began the reconstructivist project of developing new epistemologies. And here comes the lecture of Dr. Lina Pujari that explained connection between rise of feminist movement and recognition of sexism and androcentrism in social theories, which had previously been considered objective knowledge production. Feminist theorization granted the prime position to experiential knowledge and challenged positivism. The third world theories like Judith Butler, Gayatri Spivak critiqued 
idea of universal experience of womanhood and drawing attention to sexual, sexually, economically, and racially excluded uh, uh, sections of society. Kimberly Crenshaw's put forward a critical race theory and coined the term intersectionality in 1989 to describe how systems of operation overlap to create distinct experiences of people with multiple identity categories. Thus, feminist social theorists in each wave have critiqued male biases implicit in social theory itself and helping to construct social theory that draws the experiences of all those who have faced various types of marginalization and exclusion. So ultimately, if feminism is broadly understood, is concerned with improving condition of women in society, family, feminist social theory is about developing ideas, concepts, philosophies, and other intellectual programs that help meet this agenda. So action is very much a part. So it's not only theorization, but theorization and praxis for social transformation. So feminist social theory, like any theoretical tradition, is a best seen as a continuing conversation of many, many voices and viewpoints. And I think that we are going to discuss today. I request Dr. Lena Pujari to, to, to start her distinguished lecture. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Um, thank you uh, for that uh, kind introduction from the IMPRI team. Um, and good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, and the wonderful team at uh, IMPRI for this opportunity. It's an absolute pleasure to be here once again. And I'm so looking forward uh, to listening to my co-panelists um, and, of course, interacting with the audience. And thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for giving us a wonderful sweep of you know, the theoretical landscape and uh, listening to her and, and, of course, the feminist interrogation uh, that was happening. And I was listening to her and I was thinking, if you look at the broad, you know, that range of theories that you have, and probably in the, given the time frame that I have, I, I really don't know how much can I cover. But here is an attempt and I'm sure my, uh, my co-panelists will, will bring up many more things and um, many things will also come up during the discussion. So interestingly, um, you know, uh, Dr. Patel, she began with a quote by Simon de Bauer, and I'm also going to begin with a quote by Simon de Bauer. And here we go. And first, let me share my screen. Is my screen uh, visible, Dr. Uh, Atu? Yes, yes ma'am. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So uh, this is what I begin with, and this is a quote by Simon de Bauer. And she says, representation of the world, like it's, uh, uh, you know, one sec, one sec. The screen is a little, ah, yes. So uh, she begins by, uh, she, she says a very interesting thing. She says, representation of the world, like the world itself, is a work of men. They describe it from their own point of view, which they confuse with absolute truth. Um, and this is where I actually wish to begin my presentation. So social theory. Of course, this is not about men and their point of view. It's also about patriarchal discourses. So um, it is an established fact that social theory has been patrilineal, has been patriarchal. As Barbara Marshall says, it's a procession of men, largely white. And to this, I would add, uh, you know, privileged, largely privileged, able-bodied uh, cis men. And of course, from a certain location, geography matters a lot, primarily from in the context of uh, Europe and America. So this whole business of knowledge production has privileged both the male subject and the male knower. Right? So, you know, masculinist discourses proliferate our social, political, philosophical theories and knowledge making processes, so on and so forth. And they have been variously described as, you know, male stream theory, androcentric assumptions, so on and so forth. Now, I don't think it's enough to say uh, that there have been silences, omissions, and um, you know absences. I think a more systematic process is at work here. This doesn't seem to be by default, but if you look, you know, it it it, it seems as though it has been by design. You know, uh, Janet Pool, for example, talks about how masculinity has operated as um, you know uh, the core foundational principle of the social. For instance, uh, to the epistemological question, who can be legitimate knowers? 
The answer has historically been not women. And therefore, I think we have to dig deeper and see the epistemological foundations, um, you know, the methodological assumptions and the ontological positions, you know, that, that underpin and undergrade these masculinist discourses. Now, most of us, of course, have been schooled in this canon. Um, and I'm sure you would agree with me on this. And we've experienced various degrees of discomfort. But um, uh, I'm sure the classics cannot be read today the way we read. So I think a critical unpacking of this canon is uh, the first starting point. So I know something that Carol Batman talk, says, uh, refers to as the feminist subversion of the social and political theory. I think that is in order before we can actually start with this whole process of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, feminist reimagination of the social. So, um, you know, I, I begin, so of course, a rich, as, as Dr. Patel has just uh, told us, you know, rich body of feminist thought has actually interrogated the canon at various points of time. So when we start looking at these theories from the classical, and I'm going to begin with the classics, I generally like, I'll begin with the classics. And, um, and if you look at, when we begin from the classic to modern and even beyond, one is struck by, you know, a series of, um, dualisms and binaries that permeate our theories, okay, that have been, you know, most of the, the development of these theories have been characterized uh, by these kind of binaries, you know, public versus private, private that Dr. Patil spoke about, universal versus particular, modern versus tradition, so on and so on, it goes, you know, the partisan dualism kind of thing. And I will, of course, return to this question uh, uh, a little later in my presentation. So, um, you know, uh, 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 when, when we start with the political philosophers, and of course, I start with the Greek era, because uh, that's where that was supposed to be the cradle of civilization, where we had these uh, great intellectuals and philosophers, Rousseau, Plato, so on and so forth. And we know, of course, that was an extremely misogynist era. But just to tell you a little bit about um, what a great philosopher thought about women and where did women figure in their, in their theories. You know, Rousseau in his, and uh, Susan Okin has done wonderful work in this area. And she says that Rousseau in his book, um, uh, the book is titled very interestingly as uh, Discourse on the Ideology and the Foundations of Inequality Among Men. And uh, he introduces the readers to his book and he says, it is of man that I am to speak. I mean, Rousseau, of course, um, was very clear that the presence of women is required in the private sphere because she's primarily responsible for this whole business of raising children. And in fact, he said uh, women need to be thwarted at every stage because th that would en enable them to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, to uh, their main job is to please men, and that job would come more naturally to them if they are thwarted at every stage. And if we go further, Plato, Plato was very clear and he says, uh, the pursuit of philosophy is a very rational enterprise and it requires a withdrawal from everyday mundane activity. And women are very slow to learn and they forget everything and therefore philosophy is not for women, right? And of course we had Aristotle who discussed at length about what is the highest good for a human being. And then he go, uh, proceeds to tell us that um, uh, women are not only conventionally deprived of, but also constitutionally unfit for the highest good. Okay, so um, and and then of course um, uh, he 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 said that women have a natural function, and the natural function was of course reproduction and child rearing, so that men can uh, be free to engage in politics. Now Mill, interestingly, writes a major work of feminist theory, the subjection of women. Nonetheless, even he cannot imagine, he had this discomfort with this idea that, uh, you know, uh, women could say no to household work and that women could say no to their traditional role as homemakers, primarily because unpaid work. He had a certain discomfiture with this kind of idea. So, you know, and, and in building their theories, so in each of these theories, what we see is the assumption is that the family is a natural sphere uh, where women must perform their work. Now, in building their theories, philosophers ask very interesting questions. So they ask of men, what are men like? What is their potential? But for women, the question would be, what are women for? So here we see there is an undeniable connection between the assigned female nature and the social structure. 
Even the Enlightenment thinkers, we go further, and the Enlightenment thinkers provided elaborate frameworks that furthered uh, the exclusion of women from the intellectual and public domain. So, you know, the realisms of uh, mind over body, masculine over feminine, science over nature received a further fillip at the hands of the Enlightenment thinkers. Kant, for example, identified women with inclination and men with reason. Now, when we go to the natural sciences, and this is something that I wanted to kind of um, talk about, because our social sciences are modeled largely on the natural sciences. And Charles Darwin, of course, everybody knows about it. Um, he, for him, women were biologically inferior, very weak, heads were so small, and so they could do nothing except crochet and needle work. So, the, uh, uh, so the, this question, you know, uh, the kind of, so all these frameworks, therefore, uh, and not only sort of reinforce the division between the public and the private and the other dualisms that I was talking about sometime, um, yeah, you know, was there in the previous slides, but they, what, what they also do is privilege, uh, establish the hegemony of man over women, science over nature. No, you know, so uh, science played an important part in giving a male content, okay, to this question of what it is to be a good knower. Right? So the method and ideology of modern science uh, on which, of course, our social sciences have modeled themselves have reinforced this idea of masculine hegemony and scientific hegemony. Now, if we were to go further, and I would start looking at social theories, and if I look at the founders, I mean, of course, I'm speaking from a disciplinary location, but of course, in this uh, times of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, um, you know, we also need to make a foray into other disciplines, so which is why I began with philosophy and uh, the political thinkers. But if I were to come to my own discipline, sociology, and these have been the founders, of course, I refuse to call them uh, fathers of sociology. They have been the, the, the founders of the subject. There have been other uh, women also who have been the founders, but we have never read about them. Okay, so um, August Comte, of course, was very clear, and he says, um, women and it's best that women are naturally subservient to uh, to men. Their mission is to humanize modern men because they are the epitome of uh, humanity. Right, but uh, he compared uh, the animal. He compared human beings to the animal kingdom, and he said, just as among animals, even among humans too, uh, you know, men are intellectually, morally, physically more superior uh, than women. Um, Emile Durkheim, of course, uh, uh, you know, he 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 spoke about the natural differences between men and women. And he said in the evolutionary scale, as we move up in the evolutionary scale, it is marked by increasing differentiation uh, between men and women. And in this process, men move closer to civilization and women lag behind. But he says a very interesting thing. Unlike others who basically treated men as completely disembodied, Durkheim says man is both the body and the soul. Right, so you know he has the social inside him and the society inside him, which is his personality. And there's this constant tussle between uh, the bodily senses and the social. The social triumphs in the case of the man, which is why man is um, you know moves into a civilizational kind of era. But in the case of women, she's not able to overcome the pull of the sense of the bodily senses, and therefore she lags behind, and therefore she is inferior. Now, when we come to uh, Karl Marx, uh, well, Karl Marx um, insights have been phenomenal. Uh, feminists have drawn significantly from the works of Karl Marx. And um, uh, Marx did not develop a theory of gender, but uh, he talks about uh, how the capitalist system exploits women uh, in, in um, at least a couple of his works and more. In, in German ideology, he talks about how the father appropriates the labor of the women and the children. Then in Capital, he talks about how the family treats women as private property. Um, then, of course, he's talking about how the capitalist system exploits uh, women. But everywhere, the focus is on um, you know women as a factory worker. You know, he discusses at length about reproduction of labor power and how that is fundamental to uh, the proliferation of the capitalist system. Uh, but he doesn't acknowledge uh, uh, the role that women play in the reproduction of the labor power. He makes absolutely no mention about it. He doesn't talk about the surplus labor that is extracted from the uh, you know, unwaged worker. So these are the kind of sort of silences and absences which have remained in in. in um, a Marxian theology. Now, in all these uh, sort of um, 
that we look at this theory, certain things become, um, you know, certain things are stand out. And what we see is that, that there are these distinct boundaries between the public and the private, with most of the theorizing happening around uh, industrialization, capitalism, urbanization, citizenship, contract, you know, freedom, equality, reason, interestingly, all the hallmarks of modernity. But a, a woman's subjectivity is construed as being of a fundamentally different character from that of the man. And therefore, women can never be the modern subject. Okay? So this kind of dualism that we see universal and particular with the, you know, with the, uh, with the public universalized humanity, obviously referring to man, and the, it is to be counterposed with the private world of particularity, which is that of women. So the ontology of the social is certainly masculine without that. It's built into it. And in fact, if you look at these theories and, and their, um, you know, if you look at these theoretical frameworks, one thing that will obviously strike you is they seem to be based on, they have actually been built in opposition to women and everything that is associated with femininity and women's bodies. In fact, uh, Mary O'Brien talks um, about how our theoretical heritage lacks the philosophy of birth. And uh, other kind of uh, feminists have taken this forward and have said that how we kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, privilege, you know, we, we, we don't mention of physical birth, but what um, we have privileged is this whole idea of how, of, of how the masculine gives birth to a social and political order. So, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the classical social theory constructs a very disembodied, abstract, rational subject as the ideal subject of, of modernity. Now, in a structuralist world, what I just discussed or what I just presented before you is a very kind of it is structuralist world that I was looking at before we uh, move into post structuralism and all that. But you know, in a structuralist world, we were overwhelmed by these positivist functionalist uh, knowledges. You know, when we move into a post structuralist world, I mean. No doubt, post-structuralism has forcefully challenged, um, uh, you know, uh, claims of universality and homogeneity. But then the, uh, the the epistemological and theoretical frameworks haven't changed much, you know. Uh, you know, from the, those dualisms are still there. If earlier it was tradition and modernity, now it is um, um, modern, modern and postmodern. It is colonial and postcolonial, and you know, these kind of dualisms have continued. And of course, um, I will not, because of paucity of time, I'm not going to get into post-structuralism, but I'm sure we can take it up during discussion if, 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 if and when it comes up. And of course, I'm expecting my co-panelists also to take it up. So if one, if one looks at the ramification, so, all right, we know about this androcentric body of knowledge that we have. Now, what are the possible ramifications or are the consequences of, of having this kind of thing? I think the consequences are humongous. I mean, this kind of positivist, functionalist frameworks continue to reverberate, continue to resonate, not just in the classrooms. I mean, it happens in the courtrooms, it happens in laws, it happens in policies. I mean, even today I have my colleagues asking me, feminist research, is that research at all, right? Or, you know, why are we even debating? I often wonder that even now we are debating whether marital rape can be a criminal offense or not, or whether it can be criminalized or not. And why did it take such a long time for Section 377 to be read down? I mean, look at our understanding of democracy is so problematic, understood primarily with respect to um, the public space, you know, the ideas of liberty, equality, justice seem to work very well within the public space, but any attempt to bring it inside the house, inside the home is met with a lot of resistance. And, you know, so, and today, if we see populist discourses, the populist discourses are populated with this kind of the androcentric, masculinist kind of, um, you know, uh, a kind of um, discussions, discourses, understanding that are right these days. So the so so they all, so you know so what has been now coming to this whole thing of uh, feminist reimagination. Now, um, in terms of the the, the feminist uh, responses, um, the initial response was, of course, um, you know what uh, Carol Bateman uh, she talks about politics of equality. The first response was, uh, okay, we women are not there, so let us kind of add women. 
um, let us include women. You know, it was a typical add and stir approach. Uh, we didn't ask any questions about epistemology and ontology. Uh, women were just accommodated. And, uh, you know, some of the feminists, Dorothy Smith, for example, she talks about, and others as well, when you accommodate women within the existing patriarchal frameworks, then women become surrogate with men. Um, they will be pale reflections of men or they become duplicate men. Is that what we are looking at? And in this, in this, so this whole thought of a feminist reimagination then cannot be about incorporating women or adding them uh, because uh, without questioning those frameworks, I think that wouldn't work. Um, this is something that has, I mean, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, a feminist imagination has also uh, started, um, has also been underway in India, uh, especially in, uh, in, in SNIT Women's University, in Bombay University, um, and everywhere we have been, we've had feminist scholars, including Dr. Patel, um, people like Veena Konacha, Maitri Chaudhary, asking these questions about what do we really want? So, you know, when, when this whole uh, idea of feminist reimagination or women's study centers were introduced in different campuses in India, in, in different universities in India, the whole idea was that mainstream disciplines had to come under this feminist scrutiny, not just interrogation, but also reconceptualization and whether that is actually happening. And then we realized that what was happening was this add and stir approach. What was happening was a politics of equality, but not a politics of autonomy. So what we really, so imagination then is about this politics of autonomy. Now, so what, what is this politics of autonomy? What we need is a fundamental restructuring and reconceptualization of the public and private, of modes of knowing. It is about bridging the gap, um, you know, bridging this distance between the personal and the political that Kate Millip spoke about. It is about raising fundamental questions about epistemology, methodology, ontology, and the whole social, political, scientific, and metaphysical underpinning of patriarchal theoretical systems needed to be shaken up. Now, what would that essentially entail? And here I will bring in Dorothy Smith, because she actually talks about this epistemic shift. What we essentially need when we talk about uh, reimagination is an epistemic shift. Um, you know, and she she uh, she starts by you know she says that the roots of women's oppression lie not so much in her social and cultural exclusion as in the structures of knowledge that have mapped the world. So this intellectual and social world that we inhabit, where we do research, where we build up our theories is basically centered around the experiences of men. And she refers to them as the inner circle. And she says, this is where men produce knowledge for men and about men, and from where women are totally excluded. So there's a certain dissonance here. There's a certain disconnect. It appears as a we, we meaning women, we stand outside this entire corpus of knowledge because it is separated from our everyday lives. I mean, it does not speak to us. It doesn't, we don't have a conversation. It does not have a conversation with our concrete material lives. So this process of knowing or constructing knowledge does not recognize our embodied and embedded selves, removes the local, personal, and the everyday from the process of theory building, and erases what we are essentially embedded in, which is our ties of kinship and family and household. So it, and, and of course, she talks about this relations of ruling, a, a term that she borrows from Marxian theory uh, to describe how it is, it is this, uh, uh, you know, it is this um, a group, uh, an organization invested with power, which actually within the academic, which sets the academic agenda, um, and all of them, of course, invariably happen to be men. And she says, I become, um, uh, she talks about, so she talks about this bifurcated consciousness, and she says, I became acutely aware of this bifurcated consciousness, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this division between the world of work and the world of home. Uh, which, which um, uh, you know, and, and, and this constant shifting, I mean, the constant shuttling that it needed uh, between a consciousness organized within the relations of ruling, which is constantly telling you that, look, you have to maintain a division between the public and the private, and a consciousness that is implicated in the local particularities of home and family. So the intellectual world actually appears, uh, the, the intellectual world which is out there actually appears genderless. Uh, and if I may extend this further in, in, in the Indian context, it actually appears classless, classless. Um, it actually appears very ableist. 
um, and, and far removed from our experiences, far removed from where we are placed and far removed from our understanding. So she asked, she asked, can we have another mode of inquiry, another way of knowing, another way of theorizing? So a feminist mode of inquiry might then begin with women's experiences from women's standpoint. And she actually asks whether the everyday world with this messiness is disorganization, personalized ways of knowing, can that be the subject of inquiry instead of the abstract, context independent, value neutral and objective sort of universal world that exists um, outside us? So the whole fundamental question is, can we locate the knower in the everyday world of experience? I think if we do this, then women become both the subjects as well as the objects of knowledge. And I think such a refashioning and reimagination is necessary. If feminist theory is to avoid the, the intellectual perils of abstraction, idealization, and irrelevance, uh, which underpin theoretic, which have underpinned patriarchal theoretical discourses in the past. So feminist reimagination seeks actually, uh, you know, a, a new discursive space, a space that will encourage a proliferation of voices, a plurality of perspectives and interests, new methods of knowing, and not privileging any one of the two. And also, um, I'm acutely aware of the fact that Dorothy Smith, in fact, was critiqued for privileging uh, one kind of experience. And then, of course, she clarified saying, it's not about privileging. This is not, as she says, it's not a sociology. It's a sociology for women, but it's not a sociology about women. So um, it's about privileging all marginal voices, not one. So I think I will end by emphasizing this, that when we talk about feminist reimagination, it is not one, but multiple, just as feminism is not one, but many. It recognizes the diversity of positions. It is reflexive and it asks questions about whether feminist theory itself has erased certain uh, uh, subjectivities and experiences of those in marginal locations, for example, the queer, uh, you know, uh, people from Dalit, um, you know, the, whether the Dalit uh, subjectivities, epistemies have been included. Um, it is also intersectional. It is not just reflexive. Um, it is intersectional. It recognizes the fact that we all come from different social locations. And it is very, very important to understand how these locations intersect to produce different kinds of experiences for each one of us. Uh, thank you so much. I, I don't know whether I stuck to, whether I'm well within my time, but thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Lina Pujari for a very, very mind-blowing as well as a very erudite presentation. One, uh, uh, covering such a huge canvas, right from Aristotle, Plato, Rousseau, Kant, Mill, uh, 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 Durkheim, Marx, post-structuralist, post-structuralist, post-modernist, all schools of thought you have said, and it's also a humbling experience to say, and in feminism, that it is not only one particular my way or highway, if there are plural meanings of feminism, and it is continuously growing discipline. So I would like to ask Professor Polly, how would you like to respond to what Dr. Pujari has presented? Uh, thank you so much to the organizer for giving me this privilege to talk uh, in this and to be a part of this esteem uh, gatherings and also to the, uh, to the students and scholars who have joined us. Uh, as I was listening to uh, Dr. Pujari, and this happens to me quite often. I get very convinced uh, when I listen to the theory, different theories of um, different social theories and other theories too, because uh, I come from a different, my root is from geography. And when we talk about geography, geography is still a very masculine subject and coming and doing research from uh, geography and that too on gender geography was, uh, was pretty difficult in many ways because uh, those feminists, uh, those knowledge that I have acquired or, or, uh, or created in my research was very difficult to convince them these are different sets of knowledge and it, it belongs to geography. So um, I'll be basically talking and when I listen to the theories, I, uh, that's why maybe I get very convinced because geography talks, it's, it's a very different subject in the sense because it's very quantitative and um, it is very empirical way of doing research. Uh, so, um, so basically, um, I'm whatever I will be 
giving or speaking today will be my position as a geographer first, then how from a geographer, my position uh, took a different turn as a gender geographer, now as a faculty of women's studies. So this whole, uh, and I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not talking from, I haven't taken any theories to uh, critically look upon. Basically, I'll be talking about my experience and my position. So uh, keeping in mind that we come from a very diverse culture where uh, if we look at the entire Northeast, it's a mosaic or the entire India is a mosaic of different culture. So, uh, so whatever I want to emphasize upon and whatever Dr. Pujari has said, I picked up a few points and from there I would like to stress a few, uh, few facts. Is that, um, so basically I'll be talking uh, taking my, uh, whatever I'm going to view, give my viewpoints is, is my position as a gender geographer, as a researcher, and also a researcher from Northeast India. So uh, if we really want to reimagine, uh, if we really want to reimagine like about the so uh, social theories from feminist perspective, uh, then I would like to emphasize um, my experience as a geographer gender geography and then also as a faculty of women's studies. So what I have observed is that um, when um, Pujari was talking, she, uh, she referred about representation. So uh, how, we, how representation uh, matters. So when, uh, when we talk about the theories, uh, one thing it always strikes me like, uh, who framed the theory? When did they fr frame the theory? And from where did they, frame their theory. So what was the position? So from what position did they form the theory? So when I look at these theories, a social theory, then I find that um, the, if we add another layer of, gen of gender geography, um, then we can see the space, that, sp that spatial aspects come into existence which I feel it lacks to a huge extent in many of the uh, social theories that uh, we think of. So if you really want to imagine uh, the social theories from feminist, uh, fem from feminist perspective, I feel that the representation uh, of women uh, will be far more diverse than putting them into certain structured uh, theories. So, uh, for example, when we talk about representation of women, now, when we say representation, like uh, by women, then basically it is um, uh, women's standpoint, it, the women's standpoint matters. So when, when uh, Pujari was talking about Dorothy Smith's um, standpoint, so how those theories, how the theories, which are basically we, all of the theories that uh, we discussed about or we heard were from the Western perspective. So uh, how, how do this Western theory represents women from India or how the Indian feminist represents, um, uh, represents women from Northeast India? So, or, uh, so when I was going through and I was trying to read about uh, Dorothy Smith, one thing really struck me about, and, she, and it is said that, uh, this is this one example she gives very often. I'll just read it out. And this is one example which uh, Smeet often tells about in different forum is that I just read out one day while traveling in a train in Ontario, Smith observed a family of Indians standing outside, standing together by a river watching the train pass by. It was only when having made this initial assumption that Smith realized that they were just that they were assumptions, assumptions that she had no way of knowing if they were true or not. She called them Indians, but she didn't know, but she couldn't have known for sure the, what their origins were. She called them a family, which she couldn't very well not been true. She also said they're watching the train go by an assumption that emerged solely based on a position in time and space, a position riding in the train, looking out in the family. 
So this really struck me. Now, when we look at uh, if, if Dorothy Smith was not Dorothy Smith, but it was an Indian and um, just going in that train, how that Indian would have thought about those Indian. This is something which really struck me. And uh, why I'm saying so, because many of the theories, uh, social theories, I feel that um, I, I cannot connect. I cannot connect very well uh, in the context of a woman and a feminist scholar from Northeast India. Uh, and because patriarchy has a different conceptual understanding, patriarchs in India, in Northeast are of different type. Women of our place are of different type, uh, but we have some common commonalities, but yes. Uh, so while reframing, I feel that if we take space into consideration, if space is taken into consideration along with space, if time is taken into consideration, I think uh, we can add one layer to the imagination of feminist or social theories from feminist perspective. Another thing which I felt is that uh, about uh, why uh, feminist theories together with social theories are not taken seriously. Are we going too qualitative? Because quantitative data sales, and it's a fact in the knowledge system. So can, can't we blend it together? Like our approach, can't we blend our approach together? Or maybe we have to start from the methods, the way we do the research, it also matters to create a theory or build up a theory or strand in the theory. So mixed methods, uh, our met methods needs also to be really looked upon if we really want to imagine uh, if we really want to imagine of creating a different um, layer to the social theories. And uh, for me, I feel for my whatever knowledge I have, um, this grounded theories um, are those theories which can be adopted along with social theories uh, to unconstruct the privilege, to add different layers to, um, to the social theory, to make it comprehensive for the time being, which again re requires re-looking and re-imagination in due course of time. And this is, these are what, which was, which really strike me when Vibhuti Mem asked me to uh, be a part of this. Like I, these are the things which really strike me, like how we see, um, um, how we see the women in the margin, margins not in terms of knowledge, also in geographical spaces. Uh, so if, um, like if we really want to make, uh, the social theories more comprehensive, space matters, the geographical areas matters, and along with that, how space changes with time, that would also matter. Thank you so much. Very, 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 very insightful presentation, Dr. Polly Walklin. Uh, I just wanted to add to what you said that we need a um, triangulation of quantitative and qualitative, but our experience as economists working on visibility of women in statistics and indicators says that even the way quantitative is done, uh, there also you need feminist theory and feminist lens because uh, the gender blind way of collecting data it mm -hmm. uh, can also create biases. For example, the data we have for census on labor force participation rate, the way they are, the, the question is asked, the way whole unpaid labor or the care economy work is not captured by in a quantitative analysis or in metadata. So there too, feminist lens becomes very important. Uh, this thing. I just would like to, uh, in the second round, you can tell us some of the important research is done with the perspective of time and space in the uh, 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 with feminist theorization uh, in the northeastern states uh, that would be very useful now i would like to ask professor shruti tambe to respond to both the previous speakers hello uh, thank you uh, vibhuti for having me and thank yeah. you uh, uh, dr lena for giving this very eloquent, very, very comprehensive presentation. And I must thank again, uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel for uh, planning this session because I think it was much needed. Uh, now, I must say that we should remember one very simple thing, uh, that when we teach our own disciplines, we talk about feminist critiques and um, as, in a very basic way, and I know there are many students 
today watching this. So I would really take it to a very basic starting point. That Can you switch on your video? It is on, but uh, the face is not coming. Okay. It's not clear? No. We are not seeing. No, there is none. We don't, we can't see you. Okay, I'll try it again. Huh? Give yeah, me yeah, one yeah. minute. I'll yeah, try yeah. it again. Yeah. Is there something in front of camera, ma'am? You can check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will just do it. Can you see me now? Yeah, now we can see you clearly. Okay. So, um, what I was right now saying was uh, that we find there are three kinds of critiques that are offered by feminists in from their own dis disciplinary Just backgrounds. Just your screen. We are not able to see your head. Can you see me now? Now it's okay. Okay. So I'm saying that uh, from various disciplinary backgrounds, there were critiques of mainstream theorization, mainstream research. And just now, Professor Pauli very rightly pointed out the binary divide between the qualitative and the quantitative, and many times the way in which feminist interventions are still completely neglected by uh, our own disciplines. I would add to this, and in fact, I would say that uh, we should keep in mind that there were three kinds of uh, interventions that feminists had done. To begin with, we all know that uh, there were scholars who uh, spoke about, uh, you know, how we could really add the gender component and look at our own disciplinary backgrounds, disciplinary contributions from a new perspective. And of course, Vibhuti and I, we share our own personal histories from feminist movements in Maharashtra. So those were the days when it was always called as add gender that and stir, yeah. you know, yeah. because that was the first level at which uh, all the governmental reports, all the data that was presented by various organizations in case of India, the census, the NSSO data, or other kinds of government ministry data that was coming out, feminists were continuously asking the question, what about gender as a category? Not just that give us a classified data of men and women, but gender included as a category. And I would like to remind all of you and flag here that scholars like Malini Karkal, a very, very senior demographer helped us to make interventions at the level of Indian census, uh, the way it was in the enumerators were trained and the kind of wording of questions that was done. So at the first level, I would just say in short that there was this attack on the mainstream research by adding gender, either as adding categories, either as uh, adding data or reframing the uh, conceptual frameworks. The second level, as we all know, was to work on distinctive feminist methods or to intervene and reformulate the existing methods and methodologies in particular uh, disciplines. For example, just now a geographer was talking to us. As a sociologist, I would remind you of Maria Mies and of course, Anne Oakley. And in case of India, there were so many anthropologists like, uh, you know, uh, we had so many people. And in recent times, Neera Desai was there. From economics, we had Maitrai Krishnaraj. Then we had Vibhuti Patel. So we had across India, these very important scholars who brought in new conceptual frameworks. And uh, based on those concepts, they changed the way methods were really formulated. And obviously, as Lena has already elaborated, scholars like Professor Dorothy Smith uh, gave us a lot more by talking about uh, feminist standpoint epistemology. And we know that it, before her, there were other scholars as well. So we did have uh, illustrious range of scholars, Sandra Harding, Dorothy Smith, and others of the next generation who have been talking about these issues. But I do agree with great uh, distress in my heart 
with Professor Pauli that even today in our professional conferences when we go, feminist scholars or feminist methodologies or feminist interventions are still seen as, you know, those uh, rebels who are talking something outside the accepted ethos of our own discipline. And that's not just geography, Professor Polly, but even in sociology, we find there's so much uh, emphasis on positivism, on objectivity and neutrality, on quantification, and the why question uh, essentially goes to the background. And the why about gender relations, um, even the, the lives of women, their experiences, as Dorothy Smith says, should become your focal point is never really taken very seriously. And in our legal, juridico legal or juridico administrative discourses like rape law or the Shakti bill in Maharashtra, again, the, the woman's standpoint, the victim's standpoint is not taken as the starting point or the central focal point at all. And therefore, I agree on the one hand that we must really, there are two things I would say, theoretically speaking, we should really bring in more and more interventions in the conceptual frameworks in substantive areas. For example, if you are an urbanist, you need to bring in the uh, feminist viewpoint in the urban studies. If you are a media studies person uh, accordingly, or if you are in geography accordingly. But uh, methodologically, I would say that we should go with all three options. We should work on existing, um, you know, well, can you hear me now, Vijaya? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Okay. So we must work on uh, attacking the mainstream research, showing the gaps and add gender as women and LGBTQ statistics or questions. Two, we must also intervene by reformulating methods and techniques. And three, of course, standpoint epistemology has to be our ultimate aim. Though it seems very distant in a place like India today, where the government and the ruling class are still being driven by a very, very chauvinistic male upper caste ideology. Uh, and in that scenario, any feminist intervention or critique seems like a, a extremely radical uh, rebel, you know? It is not taken as a valid scientific intervention or a normal contribution for that matter. I think for the first round, uh, Vibhuti, I would stop at this. Yeah. And I congratulations like to, and now, thanks. Now, and yeah. yeah. Now I would like to ask all three of you a question that uh, how the feminist scholarship in India has built bridges between the social theories and the work which they have done at a ground level, whether it is for policy advocacy or for the academic research or for uh, building the campaigns or even juridical legal sphere also, you need a lot of legal research. So can you give some of the examples of integration and, uh, and meshing of uh, feminist perspective in the researches over the last 30 years? Who would like to take this? Lina, can you start with? Dr. Polly, because uh, yeah. uh, you were asking her about the research, maybe she can start, I thought. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, if I talk from the Northeast perspective, uh, first, uh, surviving as women's studies is far more tough, is the toughest job. So in addition to that, uh, working and uh, standing out and contributing is another set of tasks. But in between we have, uh, like after the establishment of um, the department, first it was a center, now it's a department, um, the visibility has come in, structural visibility has come in. As uh, Professor Tambe was telling us just a while ago, like, um, uh, like how, how the masculinity are out here is very different. So from my studies, from my studies, I haven't used uh, time geography, but I have used gender geography to study about different issues. Uh, I found um, like there are uh, differences out here as Tambe, Professor Tambe was saying, like um, here 
uh, in our region, in Northeast region, and um, the men are interested to know about women's issues. They're interested to know about feminism. It's not something uh, they're against uh, feminism. Uh, they're interested and um, they're willing to hear what we say. And in due course of time, um, through my experience, it's not through my studies or something as such, but uh, being a part of uh, being a feminist scholar or being a feminist researcher, um, there are huge, there are, I won't say huge change, changes which are happening in the language, uh, more gender sensitive language has been incorporated and not just among men, but also among women, uh, changes are coming up and thereby, and those changes are also adding to uh, the creation of knowledge. Like, uh, and I, in that context, I feel, and, uh, but there are variations. There are variation, if I look at it from a geographical point of view, there are variation in uh, acceptance. And it's not, it doesn't matter uh, how educated the people are, how the, the egalitarianism uh, comes from their, um, from the livelihood. Uh, maybe because the whole of Northeast, except Assam and Tripura, which is in the plain area, rest of the Northeast have different struggles, uh, different struggles, geographical struggles, thereby um, being a rigid patriarch doesn't work for the family to run. So, and it is because of that egalitarianism is seen to a certain extent. And it doesn't, and it doesn't mean that um, violence doesn't happen. Uh, violence do happen, domestic violence do happen, but it doesn't get registered again because of the geographical area where we come from, because of the sick schedule. And the cases doesn't re get registered in the police station. These are handled by the customary laws. Uh, but uh, when, we when we did research on this customary laws and we looked into the violence which happens where customary law exists, um, the flexibility of the women to come out from those abusive situ situations are different. So, which may, and again, when, uh, from my experience as a researcher, like here people take pride in calling themselves as tribals, uh, which is again, something to do with that space where we belong to. Uh, tribe is pride. Whereas in other parts of India, tribe means a derogatory word. Uh, so, so this needs to be understood. And this is maybe, I haven't done to see, I haven't done an extensive study, but as a researcher, I've seen that uh, uh, with the existing, with the existence of four very strong women's studies department and centers in the region, but the, all the three, four centers are in Assam, but it has caused, uh, created um, changes. Uh, it has caused changes to the region and it has created some bit of ripple effect. And uh, in due course of time, maybe it will take time Definitely, it's not as strong as um, South people with feminists from uh, southern part of India or from western part of India and northern part of India. I'm not taking Kashmir and our northern part of India, but in due course of time, um, these voices are heard. These voices are raised, and um, and because maybe we live in a place where we do not find rigid patriarchs, um, the flexibilities are there. They are willing to listen. The men are not strong patriarchs, but there are. We cannot. We cannot generalize. But uh, these are certain observations and experiences which I felt as a researcher. And I think rich feminist scholarship has flourished, and that has been the experience of uh, regional conferences that we have in Indian Association for Women's Studies in all rounds. I think it was a northeastern regional conference which came up with the extremely uh, rigorous and well-researched papers. No, and I think they are coming out in anthology also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very. The scholarship among and the younger generation, there is a healthy curiosity about women's studies, and many of them are also opting for a specialization and super specialization in women's studies, which is not happening, unfortunately, in several other parts of uh, uh, India. No? That's us. Thank yeah, you. I can just add one more thing, if yeah. you allow me. Yeah, like the centers are actually, we feel that the centers are creating feminist monsters and uh, they are doing really well. And now our alumni are coming back. Yeah. And they are taking the mission forward, yeah. like uh, and through those students, um, feminist uh, 
uh, women's perspective, feminist perspective is added in the programs. So it is happening in a different way, in a different layers and different levels. This I is like your term feminist monsters because in Latin America, they call themselves feminist witches uh, <laughs> in Mexico and Argentina. Okay, thank you, sir. So now over to uh, Dr. Professor Surti Tambe, would you like to highlight some of the nuances of Dalit feminism and how it has shaken the mainstream women's studies centers in Maharashtra? Uh, I would only, uh, I, before going to that, I would like to really mark some of the historical points because Lena uh, has taken such a extensive view of the theory, but I would like to really remind ourselves I was talking about Professor Malini Karkal. Uh, similarly, I should mention uh, Professor Leela Dubey, for example, uh, made such interventions in anthropology and sociology. And uh, now in mainstream teaching, these readings have really entered, at least in select universities. For example, if we are talking about Maharashtra, I'm not too sure whether all the state universities have it, but definitely in Mumbai and Pune University college syllabus also. Uh, we do teach uh, the series uh, published by SNDT on concepts in women's studies or research uh, papers and research writings by um, these main, uh, you know, old women's studies centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I should also mention Professor Chaya Datar's work in the regional language, which in early days really made a big uh, headway for students in 80s and early 90s, she was speaking a lot in Marathi. She was writing, publishing in early 80s also. And that really changed the tenor. She, she wrote in simple Marathi for common people in, in newspapers also. And she was very active in the movement. So I would say that at least in Maharashtra, the movement space and the academic space kind of uh, moved hand in hand and the academy also popularized eco-feminist perspective yes later on later on yes so i'm saying that uh, feminism was not just theory but the movement uh, insights and the academic uh, knowledge went hand in hand in maharashtra and that was one of the benefits that we all got i think my generation lena's generation found it easier to convince our seniors in the discipline or our board of studies and so on, because there was already this major UN cry, including Professor Vibhuti Patel. There were these uh, firebrands who were already in universities, writing, publishing, researching, and talking about it in different uh, academic bodies. So the canonization of uh, feminist knowledge was quite easy that way in certain parts of India than other parts of India. But I must also say that um, now that we have almost 30, uh, more than 30 years of women's studies centers in Maharashtra, we should really think about it as Professor Vidyut Bhagavat used to always say on 8th March, is it, uh, in, in Marathi, I would just add, is it Bail Pora? Because once a year, you really uh, deck up well all your oxes and your cows, and then through the year you make them work for you. So is eighth March something like that? Tokenism basically. So women's studies centers and and Vidyut Bhagwat used to always remind us that actually it will be a good day when there's no need of a separate women's studies center, but all the disciplines are including the basic insights of gender studies and feminist theory as their uh, foundational knowledge. And I'm, I would like to just remind ourselves about it. So is, um, is the separate women's studies center idea uh, uh, turned into ghettoization of a space that now you can say it happens in our universities routinely. If there's any letter, any circular pertaining to women, send it to women's studies center. Those are the people who will look after it, you know? So are we not really trying to isolate it in a certain fashion uh, than uh, the way in which Lena was telling us how uh, feminist knowledge should become part of our disciplinary learnings and pedagogies and research practices. And at this point, I would turn to practice. And as I was trying to tell you, uh, there are many research projects and I would not pick and take a few names because across India, there are so many scholars who have contributed in different disciplines. Uh, but at the practice level, I still find patriarchal mindset controlling us. 
so uh, if it is sociology all the women issues you should you know tackle it's a soft subject and gender is a soft subject let it go to women studies or sociology departments and i find some very tough tougher disciplines psychology and economics i don't find so much of discussion about uh, gender feminism um, as being incorporated in their dis, uh, in their syllabi in their research and so on uh, and i want to just remind ourselves about suzy tharu early on she reminded us uh, reminded us that caste system in india makes multiple patriarchies operate in an entangled fashion and dalit feminism brings it in very concrete ways in front of us how patriarchies operate along with the graded inequality of caste system and therefore the debate of intersectionality in the western countries uh, uh sounds quite hollow when you look at the entanglement of caste class ethnicity and genders in india and this entanglement uh one of the major contours of it has been brought to the fore by dalit feminism but i must tell you uh, following gail ombet's uh, last work and her one of her unpublished papers where she's she's kind of flagging that dalit feminism could be the first step but more feminisms are yet to come and we 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 should therefore and there is already bahujan feminism being talked about but adivasi feminism in india and maybe adivasi feminisms because northeastern adivasis are not the same as maybe adivasis in maharashtra so the plurality of uh, uh, gendered subordination and gendered experiences has to be brought uh, to the fore empirically but also has to be theorized in more complex ways and i would say that we should be uh, we should be willing to be uncomfortable with all the new questions that come because i do remember many of our colleagues were so uncomfortable when dalit feminism started asking some very difficult questions about what do we mean by solidarity and sisterhood and i think we should be prepared to face more discomfort in the coming years we should welcome it because that's how we can understand uh, graded inequality in its gendered form and that's how voices will be heard and plurality and complexity of experiences uh, and gendered reality can be really studied more keenly thank you yeah yes professor shruti tambe you gave a very important learning from experiences in the uh, women's studies movement in maharashtra especially uh, writing in regional languages uh, taking the theories to the people uh, to to the students and the uh, getting feminist understanding mainstream in the syllabi that's very important here there is a response from professor ivan john of sopaya college sociology department that perhaps we need to push feminist and gender research into ug and pg programs and to move away from positivist obsession what would you like to say dr reena pujari yes all right i was I, uh, yeah that's a very interesting question something that i can relate to very well um in fact um uh, we have done that we have made an attempt to push this and i can talk about my experiences of curriculum design uh, within sociology but um uh, as uh, uh, shruti said that perhaps in sociology it's uh, you know it's easier done than in other subjects you can convince our police Uh, yes to a certain extent but i must also say that it has been a huge challenge uh, my attempt to integrate uh, feminist ideas theories uh, research modules um, have been met with stiff resistance let me tell you that by my own colleagues so uh, you know when um, uh, 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 you know ivan john talks about lesbian and asexual voices too absolutely so when we as shruti talked about uh, the discomfort that people experience when uh, dalit uh, kind of um, uh, you know uh, uh, you know the questioning the whole idea of sisterhood and things like that that made people very very uncomfortable i think we faced a similar thing uh, when it came to um, uh, introducing uh, you know, when we introduced queer studies sexuality studies 
uh, we were met with a lot of resistance. I mean, um, I, you know, teachers were very, very uncomfortable with the idea that we have to teach these kind of things. And they said, our students are not ready. Um, you know, we will be accused of um, all kinds of, um, you know, uh, the, the parents will be upset that you are teaching students these kind of things. I mean, these were the kind of things and and there was this pedagogy of, um, you know, uh, silencing those topics. So these topics would not be engaged with in classrooms. It was a real struggle. I, I still remember when we had introduced this and there was a lot of resistance that I faced, uh, that some of us faced uh, and, and our colleagues were upset. And then two months later came the Supreme Court judgment. Uh, reading down section 377 and I think that was a that was a savior and the judgment also spoke about uh, asked the government to sort of um, a, you know uh, uh, popularize I mean uh, uh, help people understand these issues in college well, like India issues. also accepted in UNHRC no yes, yes. Diversity so uh, yeah so I think uh, Shruti the it's a challenge and, and and the challenge continues we are pushing from the margins but you have to be at it you cannot stop um, we have introduced a lot in terms of research. I mean, even, even so, for example, if you want to, uh, in a research methodology paper, if you want to have a module on feminist research, um, but people will say, you already have a paper on gender. Why do you want research here? So if you want to push feminist theory in a paper on uh, sociological theories, classical social theory, modern social theory, they will say, but why are women? There's already a paper. I mean, so I think the resistance is, and as Shruti said, it is perceived as very radical as a kind of rebellious thing. And there is, I don't know why it is perceived as so intimidating, right? Instead of, you know, uh, being comfortable, I mean, instead of embracing this discomfort and instead of being open to the idea of uh, these, uh, you know, challenges and the need for, uh, you know, uh, revisioning, I mean, a revision of your theories and your perspectives in light of the criticisms, um, we tend to resist a lot. So that is certainly there. That continues. But as I say, we have to be at it. You can't give up. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very, very important that we all three types of pressure, global pressure, then the lateral push, and also pressure from below. So I think we have to keep, keep the issues of um, mainstreaming uh, disciplines, uh, all the mainstream disciplines to be uh, engendered, and also the feminist thinking. Because there are there is a lobby which says that now we are in a post-feminist phase. So I think that also we need to yes, yes, answer, yes. no? So, uh, uh, ma'am, can I add one thing here? Yeah, Dr. please go ahead. So, you know, you spoke about the, the contribution of uh, feminists in Maharashtra to, to research, to policy. And I can think about only the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the SNTT Women's Studies Center. And you, you have done a lot of work in terms of uh, interventions in policies and programs and things. Um, Veena Punacha, Dr. Veena Punacha, Veera Desai. In terms of um, discipline uh, and reimagination, I think um, Sharmila Rege, Vidud Bhagat, uh, Bhagat, I think they have contributed immensely. And uh, more recently from Bombay University, in fact, Geeta has been engaged in this um, feminist uh, reimagination project. Um, and um, of course, Maitri Chaudhary, uh, from JNU. I mean, uh, these are some of the names that come to my mind instantly when it comes to kind of feminist insights and bringing these feminist insights. And now UGC has also recorded these lectures at the EPG Patshala. And in women's studies, there are 20 subjects. Within uh -huh. each subject, there are 20 lectures. So total 400 lectures have been already recorded. And they have been used by uh, students who are, because there are certain states which have which are offering women's studies at bachelor's level also. Andhra Pradesh is one. And uh, many other colleges and universities have introduced a paper within different disciplines on women's studies, no? whether it's a sociology or economics or political science or literature. So there it is useful. So I think it's very important to spread this because main thing is uh, availability of literature to the common students because it has not reached the Bal Bharti level. Though National Education Policy 2020 talks about uh, taking uh, women's concerns and gender sensitization right from preschool to at all level, but it is only a platitude. Nothing has happened at a ground level. So I think the challenge is for all of us to take it to the way Chaya has done in Marathi Thing we all have to do in our respective languages yeah so uh, now polly would you like to say some of the important uh, researches in northeast 
Yeah, uh, my video is not coming out, but whatever. Uh, so uh, I would just uh, add to that question about um, about not like uh, why programs UGC uh, in undergraduate programs, research, gender research programs in undergraduate and PG programs. We have a very different type of scenario now. Uh, and uh, it's not research program because research like in undergraduate research doesn't work so well among Indian university. But in, PH, in PG level, in the later part of the PG level, the research becomes much more, this research aptitude among the students becomes stronger. So uh, that is one point. And we can see another type of uh, trend in our universities in, in Northeast India. Uh, like initially we had difficulties having students to take our women's studies. But of late, we have seen that um, since they study or they have um, a paper in their respective, in their mainstream subject. So we are getting students from different disciplines, also from science, okay. uh, who have taken a master's MA in women's studies. Yeah. And we have people from commerce. We have, we, like, it's not in high, high numbers. But there are students who are coming from different subjects and taking our women's studies. And this is not out of compulsion. Like if they don't get it in some other subject, they are taking admission. It's not that. It's by choice. Yeah. They come here by choice. But the disturbing factor is that we are getting lesser amount of male students. Ah, okay. This is another issue that um, yeah. we are facing. It's measure Now, now we, 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 we get lots of applicants. Like when we started IMA in women's studies way back in 1912, 2012, uh, we had only, we had 28 seats and uh, there were around 30 applicants. But now a number has increased to 42 students and we get more than 200 and 250 applicants. Yeah. And what about uh, certificates and diploma? I think there you get so many working people, no? That, uh, and the it's, it's in MA, it's in MA in women's studies. Uh, MA, yeah, it's a full-time course. So. Full-time, full-time But course, what about, full -time. Uh, should we also have more and more diplomas and uh, certificate courses in feminism? Yeah, we, we uh, need to do that. In this experience, we, we got an excellent response. We had a, a course on feminism. Lena was also there. Nine lectures were there, uh, spread over three days. It was okay. an immersive course, online course, and we got a very good response. So I think we, we and in undergraduate courses, what is happening, we have re re uh, regularly we conduct refresher courses. So those faculties are going back to their colleges and they want to introduce uh, certificate courses in, the, in, in in their colleges. The problem is that government is not giving us post. So now NOC has to be produced by the colleges that they will not demand post. So these are the things which are coming in to carry forward uh, the whole um, knowledge of women's studies in our region. And um, uh, Professor Patel, you had another question. I, I yeah, slipped yeah, off my mind. Yeah. And then I would also like to ask Dr. Lina Pujari, her experiences of running a course on, uh, for, for gender course for past 12 years. What have been the, because the, yours is basically a commerce college and still you are getting good response. And, uh, Professor Ivan John is asking, is it, it is interesting to know that we can under NEP 2020 think about increased probability for cross-pollination as artificial divisions such as arts and science get melted down, which is also true. Yes, very important. Very, very yeah. important. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, uh, uh, we have been doing this. Uh, mine is, of course, uh, mine, uh, a small correction. It's a uh, arts, commerce, and science college. All three together. You get yeah, uh, we do get, again, the same uh, problem that we have. We have been ru running it for now eight to nine years now, and the course, and the same problem that Dr. Uh, Holi uh, mentioned about, we get very few uh, cis men as such, uh, as participants in the course. Um, but, you know, and this running the course is also kind of, um, uh, you know, taken me to this whole debate that the... Uh, uh, that uh, we had here, right here in Maharashtra, when, when, when we had these women's study centers that we established about, and the kind of debates and discussions that happened among feminist scholars about uh, what are we supposed to do, and um, uh, are these courses something that should be also uh, brought up? That is it a, a ghettoization? Is it about uh, so when we uh, insist on women's studies separates the women's studies separate center, does it lead to a kind of ghettoization? Uh, instead, should we have an integration into all disciplines? But there's a problem there also. 
because when you talk about integration into other disciplines, so if I talk about women's studies being integrated in commerce courses, I mean, you can just, so not that it's not possible, but then the whole question is, uh, what about pedagogical practices? Uh, who's going to teach those courses? I mean, it, uh, teaching women's studies is not just like teaching any other mainstream subject. Like it is a, you, yes, you need to be imbued with those kind of feminist insights and things like that. And that doesn't happen. So very often, even in FC Foundation course, when these courses are introduced, I mean, uh, either if, if the teacher is good and if the teacher has an exposure to these ideas and these feminist ideas and concepts, she does a good job of it. Otherwise, it's just like any other way. It's a sad state of affairs. The way uh, the, the way these papers, the way these topics are taught, in fact, uh, if you look at the guidebooks, some of the guidebooks that we have are, are absolutely oh, pathetic in terms of stereotyp uh, stereotyping women and the way that, I mean, for example, one of the guidebooks will tell you that, um, the re, uh, one of the reasons for domestic violence is the nagging behavior of the woman. The nagging behavior of the wife apparently is, and that has been written by someone who comes from a commerce background. So these are things that we really need to- the nursing textbook. No, the these dowry, are- Advantages of dowry, ugly women can be- Yeah, that is one. Married. But I'm talking about at the UG level uh, at, uh, at, at in Mumbai University, these are the texts. But one thing about running this course is, Okay, our course is um, is very different because in the sense that, um, you know, uh, one of the main objectives of doing the course is, of course, to raise a critical feminist perspective. And we are very careful about the pedagogues, uh, you know, that we invite uh, to, to administer the course. But, uh, you know, uh, in the sense we have filmmakers, we have feminist filmmakers, lawyers, uh, we have academics, we have we, we get a whole lot of people from the movement, you know, from the LGBTQI plus plus and other activists coming in. And they are themselves very passionate about this. Yeah. And therefore, uh, you know, um, they bring to the course a certain dynamism uh, and, you know, uh, which, which kind of sparks, uh, sparks this kind of, which, which triggers the spark for change. So the whole idea of doing this course is to bring about a transformation. And that is something I feel we have been able to achieve to some extent. I mean, I will not say that every student in the course, every year gets transformed, but certainly, there are people um, uh, for whom the course has brought about massive changes in their lives, in, in the families, in their neighborhoods. I mean, they've been able to do that. They become the harbingers of change. They have been able to engender these kind of conversations within family. Also and then you, when you say, no? agency. yeah, absolutely. And then you realize that these, uh, you know, these students are actually they're so oppressed within their homes, within their families, within the but they find a space where they can express themselves. You know, they, they find a safe space. We have a large number of students who come from uh, the queer community. And it is here that they get to speak, uh, you know, to have a conversation. So that I think has been a big contribution of this particular course. I think in, in what way feminist thinking and also the art world, because their appeal is much more, no? So whether it's a media, so media as well as films and other cultural practices. How can we bridge the gap between, how can we reach out to them to make it, because that was happening during 80s and 90s. Uh, can we do it now also in current context, is it possible? Yes, so, of course, certainly. In fact, in a course, the emphasis is to bring on board people who have been involved in those projects. So we have quite a few filmmakers who come in, um, people who have been writing scripts. Uh, you know, these are, in, in fact, the people who have made lovely documentaries. These are the people in where we are constantly. You know, we had last time a theater activist who actually joined us from uh, Meghalaya, uh, you know, to do, uh, because we have gone online now in the last two years, we actually could get uh, uh, active uh, people from the grassroots. So people who are engaged in the struggle with Adivasis in Orissa in some remote corner have come as a resource person. We had a theater activist who came from Meghalaya who joined us from Meghalaya. So we have a diversity in terms of, yeah. um, you know, the faculty. So that I think lends a different kind of uh, sort of color to the whole course. I yeah. And I think uh, Professor Ivan John is also with the Pokolara group, no? So I think through music and art and uh, creative expansion verses and all, they're also, I think they are bringing changes. Uh, up. Lovely, lovely, yes. Yeah. So now, uh, would any one of you either ask question, then in that case, you please uh, unmute yourself and switch on your video and you can ask the question or intervention or whatever uh, your experiences are there in this field of feminist uh, discourses, you can share. The floor is open for all. 
someone has raised no nobody has raised it okay then should i conclude or any of the panelists discussants would you like to speak professor shruti professor doctor professor not Pauline. really thank you no, thank you okay. for a very extensive discussion and yeah. it was okay. a pleasure joining as discussant yeah. so thank i would you. like to conclude because i think today's major question that we were trying to answer was that how feminist theory matters today now it is undeniable that feminist political movements have made tremendous gain over last 150 years the social scientific evidence demonstrates that there are still large inequalities between men and women uh, in uh, there are uh, sexual minorities are completely excluded uh, there are there are so many we, we ha still have persistent transphobia uh, when it comes to areas like income and wealth political power opportunities legal rights sexual assault rape domestic violence and the overall status of those who are at the margin and who are underserved as long as gender inequality and oppression exists feminism and feminist thought will continue to matter to millions of people throughout the world moreover feminist intellectuals continue to develop cutting edge and nuanced understanding of social world that enriches the power and possibilities of social theory writ large feminist knowledge and its impacts on other academic disciplines which began in 1970 during the 70s but it and so many examples were shared by professor uh, uh, no, tambe professor polly and professor dr lina pujari uh, from various regions whether it's the northeast or maharashtra or even in delhi uh, and several parts of our country the way women studies have centers some of them have made pioneering contribution so it is now there is uneven impact in different disciplines uh, some of some disciplines have responded as sociology uh, was the first one to uh, respond to feminism but uh, slowly and gradually we are seeing that the economics geography psychology political science and even the literary theories uh, they they have uh, which have, which were largely mainstream they have been now uh, humbled and feminist in, uh, discourses have gained credibility uh, based on the standpoint epistemology the emergence of uh, so called uh, post colonial women as the new proletariat i think that maria mises work also uh, brought out that women as a last colony Uh, and this exploration became basis for the discussion in distinct feminist political economy of development micro level researches which are grounded in women's experiences as dr rashiti tambe also told us that it's a link to the theoretical analysis of development which takes gender as a primary analytic the standpoint of post colonial societies women's challenges not only male centered development theory but also western feminism the way professor polly told us and i think all three speakers they also accepted that we need to we, there is a no one uh, brand of feminism but there is a plurality of experiences plurality of uh, uh, theorization and uh, their applications in the research thinking documentation training knowledge construction policy intervention and even the Uh, juridical thinking and now we also have a team of young researchers feminist researchers who are challenging uh, gender uh, the uh, gender biases in the medical colleges and gender in medical education has become now a big important assignment which many feminists and the people's uh, science movement and the gender swasthya abhiyan have taken place and there also feminists are entering into dialogue with the professionals uh, such as scientists and doctors and in fact when we started our campaign against sex selective abortion it was the scientists from brc who invited us in fact they they we started with the study circle on simanti boer's second sex and then we went to say that how this perspective would relate to the question of sex selective abortion and the, the overall subordination of women in indian society so i think the uh, the, the the scope for feminist uh, discourses is very high we have seen after 2013 here by a tragedy younger generation is increasingly inviting feminists uh, to have a dialogue to uh, to to address them earlier when we there, there was a, there was a strong message that you all have become dinosaurs and we are in a post feminist world i don't think that is true there is a tremendous interest in feminist theorization and feminist critique of the mainstream social theories 
thank you very much for, or to all of you, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Lina Pujari, our discussants, Professor Shruti Tambe and Professor Polly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Over to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Arvika, shall I start, sir? Yes, go on. Just for formal vote of thanks. Yes. Thank you, everyone. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Zubia Moi, researcher at INTRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. We are grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel for chairing and leading the special talk on feminist reimagination of social theory. We'd also like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Dr. Lina Pujari, for taking out her precious time to share her views on this crucial topic. We thank our esteemed discussants, Professor Polly Rockleen, Professor Shruti Tambe, for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to this deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our Gender Gap series and IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.